Welcome to episode 42 of the Fight for Together podcast. Yes, welcome, <laughs> everyone. You, you have no idea what we're going to talk about today. I yeah. just took a quick glance at your notes. You did? But I really don't know. Are you excited? Sure. You're listening to the Fight for Together podcast. Okay, today I'm really excited about this topic. You know, this podcast, just to give you a little bit of behind the scenes, we don't spend as much time preparing as I'd like. In my mind, we're going to have this like concise thing um, that really conserves your time and is this exhibition of communication and simplicity and convincingness. Maybe someday we'll get there. It's possible, but if you guys have heard our, we have an ad that we do for the Anchor app now that we make money off of. I think, by the way, we're up to like 12 or 13 bucks. Um, and the, it's, it's a, it's a true ad that I recorded, um, about this app because the, the thing that pushed us over the edge into thinking that we could record our own podcast was actually listening to Casey Neistat's podcast, which was really interesting at first because I liked Casey Neistat. And then it really became not that interesting to me. Oh crap. Hang on. Pause. Bring that over here. All right. Ben needs to light a cigar real quick. We're trying to use one match. Trying to conserve here, folks. Mm. I think you got it. Thank you. Thank you. But anyways, what I enjoyed about their podcast and what gave me a lot of hope was that they just turned on the microphone and went for it. And they just talked conversationally. So anyways. And it lasted, I don't even know, but not very long. <laughs> okay, I don't think they're doing it anymore. But that type of production level made me finally think, oh, we can handle that. Yeah. Part of your cigar is not lit, but maybe if you puff on it hard enough. Yeah, you're doing it. Okay. You're doing it. So, to start off with, um, we got some comments from last week. Um, and here is... You want to read these? Yeah. Let me make the window bigger. Go for it. Okay. Practically prolific writes, given all this insight, I'd really love to know how therapists might choose to educate their children and the whys behind that. I wonder if it's common for therapists to apply some of their insights around human nature and self-ownership to the way they choose to operate around education. Is that it? That's it. What, do you want more? Oh, no. Well, I think she's saying that I wonder if therapists, because last week's episode, or I guess by the time they hear this, it'll be two weeks ago, was about what we've been learning from therapy as a mindset. And I'll bet kid, uh, ther- <laughs> I'll bet therapists, it impacts all of their relationships, especially their relationships with their kids. I, I guess I'm trying to understand this comment. Like, what about, what's the education, the therapy? The ther- education the therapist gets? Or? I think they're talking about the education of the child. Oh, okay. To the way they choose. Their- okay. Huh. That's my guess. Well, I think in order to be a good therapist, you have to do your own work on yourself. Um, so it probably just depends on how much work you've actually done on yourself. Because... Yeah, that's my, what I think. All right, next comment. This is from Kelsey. Who I think is the one that left the, the several, phone call. Yeah, okay. I also want to add that another way it's weird is that you know virtually nothing about me, but I know so much about you. And calling in, knowing that my voice will be on your podcast, makes me anxious. I've listened to your podcast since the beginning and started following your vlog when you were a couple months into your AT hike. So it feels good to finally rip off the band-aid, so to speak. Yeah. I get that. Because I, I wouldn't want to, like... I, I Yeah. 
I wouldn't want, I have a hard time commenting on anyone I think is like, I don't know, bigger. Not that we're bigger, but like. Well, for to compared to, it's all relative. It's all relative. Compared right. to some people, we're huge. And that, then we don't feel very big because we compare ourselves to other people. Yeah. And you feel this sense of like, well, I'm a nobody. So why does it matter? You know, but you're not a nobody. Or at least you shouldn't be. Everyone's a somebody. Okay, final. This is from Amanda. I've listened to all your podcasts beginning to end since you first started. I prefer your previous format where you would do your main topic first and then follow up with the news and comments. With the original format, I felt like I could get connected to your theme of the week better. Kind of like I got a personal dose of Fight for Together and then we shared the rest of the conversation with other listeners through comments and the broader world through news. I have learned so much about loving, listening, and the value of togetherness from you both. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, And then Faith said the opposite. She was like, oh, I like the last two episodes. So I don't know what to think, actually. So keep on chiming in with this because the jury is still out. But... I actually listened to this comment and then I based the format off of it. We're going back to a main topic, Mm -hmm. but then there's this comment. We got a letter in the mail in the form of a book. So this book arrived, which has a giant BTW on it. And this has been sitting upstairs for a couple weeks. So I totally forgot about it. Um, And it has this little note in it where the note go. The note is also my bookmark. Hey guys, I'm sending you a copy of my new book as a way to say thanks for your podcasts and vlogs. You have shared so much with me that I wanted to share with you. I am sharing this with you not to try and fix you. I'm sure you'll find plenty of things you disagree with, but I also think you'll find some things you like. Maybe check out Chapters 5. Appreciate you guys and your family for your courage and your vulnerability. You are loved beyond words by the creator of all things and are pretty okay in my book. Um, And he wants to know what we think about the book. And this is... A guy named Derek Vreeland, who's a pastor somewhere. He told me where, but I think it's like Missouri. Is that right? Um, And most importantly, look what is in here. 20 buckaroos for for the chair fund, fund. which actually came in two weeks ago. So um, I want to retroactively put that in the jar Um, here. I... I put it on the jar for the video, but I need to put it on the audio so you guys can all. All right, that's the money <laughs> going in the jar. We need like a money here. button. Oh, uh, yeah. We need I to suppose find, we could get find that. that. And this book, it's a little bit trippy to read. Um, but I kind of feel like I owe the guy a little bit because he... He listens to our stuff, and although I've, we've never met, he's he's left quite a few positive comments, and I'm always impressed that a pastor could, um, like, hang. <laughs> no offense, yeah. pastors. Uh, but the subtitle, so the title is called By the Way, and the subtitle is, is called Getting Serious About Following Jesus. And I'm, I'm going to try and get through as much of this as I can, Derek, but what I'll tell you about the first chapter Um that I have read um, is there's a lot of emphasis on following Jesus, obviously by the title. <clears throat> and it's a message that very, very strongly resonated with me for um, what, 25 years of my life. Um, a high emphasis on lordship, um, submitting to Jesus as Lord and following him which kind of i think to most people means obedience and then almost mimicking his lifestyle and ways and like i said i I was way into that message and i don't want to say i'm against that message now um and i don't oppose it but i will say this that the emphasis for my life in the last year or two has shifted Um, And the way that I primarily uh, interact with who I know Jesus to be is actually inspired by an author named Cynthia Borregolt. Is that how you pronounce her name? And she kind of wrote about 
uh, Jesus and his primary example being in how he sees the world, not in what he did. So the way he sees people and sees the world and possibly even sees himself is the biggest differentiator between one who um, wants to, I guess, follow his teachings, or I'm not sure exactly how you would say it, but what the thing he truly brought to this world that was really different wasn't a new code to follow or even a new person to follow, although he did do that with 12 disciples, but it was actually he brought a new way to see people. So for the last couple of years, I've been really fascinated in that. Um, so anyways, that that's why I'm, I'm going to make a stab at this book, but it's it's just not really um the question we're asking right now um but i really appreciate you sending the card the book and the chair fund money and yeah. all the comments you've left in the past yeah definitely that's very cool all right let's get into today's topic um this is a really kind of a complex doozy but I have the utmost of confidence that you guys will be able to hang. Um, and I mean that. Actually, before we get into this topic, we need to have an ad break. Let's do it. Okay, I just need to write down where that was so we can put it in. Um, <clears throat> welcome back. <laughs> the YouTube people never left, but. Yeah, they're just, they're still staring at us. <laughs> okay, so. This is a long, convoluted story. You're going to have to hang with me a little bit. We're reading this book called The Divine Magician by Peter mm-hmm. Rollins, who's, I think he's a Christian, I think he'd identify as a Christian theologian in Ireland. And he tells this story, or this, um, he kind of quotes this reinterpretation of the prodigal son story. And it's kind of weird to me that he does it because. I don't really think it needs to be the prodigal son story. And I don't think he's even saying that's what the story is saying, but it got me thinking. So because of that, we're going to start with it. And for those of you that are not familiar with the prodigal son story, the prodigal son story goes something like First this. First of all, it's in the Bible. Yes. and But I don't think you need to be familiar with the Bible or care about the Bible to join in in today's conversation at all which is really our no. hope with any of our conversations yeah do you want to summarize the prodigal son story while i smile i'll try um so there's two sons and a dad and one of the sons the younger one decides that he wants the his inheritance so like all of his money from his dad and so he gets that and he leaves the family home and he goes and he uh, uses up, eventually uses up all of his wealth um, and finds himself in... How does he use the wealth? By investing wisely? Well, I don't even want to... Ju- I don't... It's like he... I don't know. He like has fun. He like drinks and has sex and parties with people i think now you're adding details i like that i mean i'm yeah okay i don't know what i don't know exactly what the text says but this is the gist right so then he finds himself in destitute where he actually has no more money even to eat or to have any kind of shelter so finally he goes to a farmer who has pigs and he asks the farmer well i guess he has no, he doesn't have the epiphany yet. Okay. So he asked the farmer, hey, can I work for you? Because I'm like starving here. So the farmer's like, sure. But still, he but he must not have a lot because he's looking at the corn cobs that he's giving to the pigs and he wants to steal them from the pigs and eat them himself. All right. Let's bring it home in the next and then, 20 seconds. So here. then he has this epiphany of like, well, I should go home and ask my dad if I can be a hired hand because the, sir, or the hired hands – or servants or whoever they were, were actually are eating way better than I am now. So that's what I'm going to do. So then he goes home and he tells his dad, Hey, I, I want the you to hire runs me out to meet him. The dad runs out to meet him. He says, Hey, I want you to hire me. The dad doesn't listen to him and says, 
no, no, you're my son. You were lost. Now you're found. You were you were dead. Now you're alive. And then gives him his signature ring and robe. And then the, the older son's pissed. And throws this big ass party and all these things. Mm-hmm. So this was always kind of told. <clears throat> the moral of the story was God's love beats both the, the kind of like rebellion of the younger son and then in later interpretations, you find out the older son was kind of being an asshole too, and the father's love was still s- super big. Okay, but this I'm going to read these like three or four paragraphs from this book, and then we'll just see where it goes. The father has an excess of wealth to spare for a son, unlike those suffering outside the gates of the estate. Despite the famine beyond the walls, a fattened calf is quickly slaughtered so the family might celebrate in style. Told from this perspective, the story charts a failure. The failure is neither in the son leaving his father's estate, nor in his attempting to go back under different conditions, but rather in accepting his father's offer to be reintegrated back into the safe enclosure of the wealthy estate. In this way, so this this author is quoting another author, but this author writes about how the story ends as it began, with a wealthy system walled off to the suffering around it surrounding it the son left with a real possibility of breaking free from his past of experiencing new ideas and of returning home with a transformative message one that would fundamentally challenge and change his family but the act was ultimately impotent it failed from the perspective of storytelling this is a classic tragedy in that nothing changes the end of the story is the same as the beginning and everything is the way it used to be Um, so then he says, this story can be seen to mimic how old orders are threatened by subversive ideas that, and seek to seduce, coerce, or even threaten in order to expunge or domesticate the threat. For instance, it's not unusual for parents to fear the strange and unsettling ideas that their children might pick up at university, even as attempting to send them to educational establishments that promised nothing but the replication of old values. Okay, so <clears throat> summarize that. Um, what this guy is saying is that one fascinating thing about this story, and like I said, I, I don't even want to get into, like, is this the point of what the Bible is saying? I don't want to have that debate. I just want to say, like, this is a fascinating observation about the story. That in a sense, the sun goes off, experiences freedom from this kind of like system that the father created um which was wealthy and nice but you know kids want to experience their own decisions at some point and maybe they should or at least be able to and then he went off and then he came back with a kind of plan but it wasn't to reintegrate and be the son again in the same way and we had always heard that that was kind of a negative thing. Like, oh, he like wasn't because he didn't think he'd be accepted. But this author is putting the, the positive spin on the idea by saying, maybe that wasn't a bad thing that the son wanted to come back. And he says, you know, I'm going to work for you instead. Like kind of bring some of these new values home. And the father shuts it down really quick. And I had always heard that as a positive thing. Like the dad shuts it down, but he overwhelms him with this party and love. It's interesting that, yeah, the son, what if he actually was starting to identify with the servants and saw himself as not as not better than they were and wanted to experience that. And then the dad right away is like, nope, you're not going to, no son of mine will be in destitute as long as I'm in control of it or something. So this is, that's all just kind of an intro for these thoughts here. Um, Because those of you guys who have been following our vlog know that we, well, first of all, we have three teenagers. Second of all, as of 2016, we have no house rules. 2019. As of 2016. (laughs) Whatever it is. Whatever this year is. 2019. We have no house rules. So our kids are like going out and experimenting with stuff. Um, 
They're staying out late. They're eating ice cream whenever they want. They're going to Bible studies, for goodness <laughs> sakes. Um, and, um, and people... Well, I don't even want to get into that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but so as a parent, there's this kind of like difficult rub with them going off and hanging out with their friends, listening to their music, creating their culture, and then coming back in our house. So I just want to read what I wrote, um, some thoughts I had this week that I think were inspired by this book. And these are a couple of paragraphs. The first sentence is, I want to create a world at home that is big enough for our kids to bring back the lessons they learn in the outside world. And the paragraph says this, too often the lessons our kids learn don't fit at home. They are forced to go outside of the home to be themselves, to fit in, to feel valued, and to engage all their faculties. Returning home becomes an exercise in mask wearing and playing a part of, stat of a static environment. What a shame when an opportunity for an environment to develop and evolve instead gets turned into an opportunity to fortify and exclude. So, you know, I've experienced this on both sides. One as a kid myself. Mm-hmm. And one is as a parent now. Yeah. So what this feels like as a kid to me is as our beliefs started to evolve, I felt like there is this viewpoint of parenting from a lot of the environment we were raised in that was like, and, and I don't think this is just religious, but I think it thrives in the religious world, which is like, we're the parents. We don't, we have the right to not change. Uh, you change as well, the kid. And we have, because we're the parents, we have the most best ideas and beliefs. And it's like, respect and honor us. And of course, there's like 10 commandments waved at people and stuff like that. Now, there's a couple problems I have with this. Two main ones. One is, the kid's can every parent i guess has the right to create those rules if they want to for their house so the kids are going to come home and they're going to play by the parents rules they're not going to listen to their rap music around their parents by the way they'll probably still listen to it they're not going to say certain words around the parents and they're not going to be honest about their true beliefs and what they're thinking and experimenting with around their parents and this is evidenced in when we did like a sex ed series like i don't know 30 episodes ago, you know, there was this idea like, okay, you're going to have premarital sex. Fine. Don't do it in my house. There's kind of this idea like, okay, fine. Live your life, but don't bring that into under my roof. Mm -hmm. So then you have the kids who are being their real selves, but the only way they can be their real selves is when they're outside in the world and away from us as parents. So it's going to, it kind of sucks to not be your real self. So for a lot of kids, it means they're going to spend less and less time at home with their parents. Because, well, yeah, and it's, yeah. It's, it's why I don't hang out with your parents. Yeah. Because I got the message pretty early on that my way of seeing the world was not valued. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't have anything against them, but I'm not going to spend a whole lot of energy on that relationship with you know who i am isn't being valued as a person and i think that's a tragedy mm -hmm. but i've also gotten used to the idea and it's like well they have the right to see the world the way they see it and it doesn't have to include me um yeah hang on i need to start the camera over um okay so the first tragedy just to review is that our kids then are not going to be themselves at home. They're going to put on these masks and they're going to say what they think we want to hear them say. And it means we'll never get the, the truest access to who they really are. And this channel is called Fight for Together and it's called that for a reason. I, I think that um, in a way it um, very highly values this whole like honor, respect, um, 
hierarchy thing, but it compromises the relationship. Like th those type of people are not your friends. Uh, well, I mean, I guess we all have different levels of masks we wear, but as a whole, if we can't accept our kids' deepest beliefs and their deepest values and appreciations, our relationship is going to be that limited. Okay, so that's the first problem. The second problem I have is this. What if our kids going off and exploring these things in the world and bringing them back home is actually the ultimate opportunity as parents that we have to evolve and mature our belief system and way of seeing the world. So I'm going to give you an example, two examples actually. One is marijuana. Um, 30 years ago, marijuana universally in America was frowned upon and seen as just like a deadbeat drug. Unless you're in the hippie community, like publicly in the media, with like even the president addressing drugs, with DARE education, with especially religious communities, anyone that did marijuana, and in the communities we were in, the religious communities, if a kid did marijuana, it was automatically seen as they're throwing their life away, they're being rebellious. It wasn't like an acceptable thing at all. You know, I mean, it's like, it was like the scene is like as bad as heroin or cocaine or anything else. <laughs> now, I, I just read in some news article, which we'll get to, I think 33 states have legalized it. Wow. So if you rewind 30 years to, and, and you're a parent and your child is off smoking pot and you find out about it and they come home and you are like, kid, that is not okay. That's wrong. Don't do that. Stay away. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to hear about it. No questions asked. It's just bad. Most kids, they still smoke pot, right? I mean, that's the typical movie. They just snuck around or did it with their friends at school. Um, so you have two tragedies there. One is, and let's forget about the legality for a second. Let's just talk about the morality. One is the kid was sneaking around from their parents and this thing that's valuable to them they can't share and they can't even talk about and they they find that it's not acceptable mm -hmm. and i think we talked about this in the black sheep episode where we know someone who actually committed suicide because in my opinion so many so much of who they were was not accepted by the spiritual community mm -hmm. that what they were into was like not in style at that time right and they smoked pot Mm -hmm. That was one of the things. Um, but the second thing was the parents now, no one's dying on that hill anymore. I mean, I'm sure people are. There's still people in the Bible Belt and whatever. People are going to fight the whole marijuana thing. That's great. Fight it if you want. But it's a losing battle at this point, culturally speaking. People are like, okay, it's not that big of a deal. Why do we make such a big deal about that? Mm -hmm. Like smoking a joint is not the end of the world. Um, you can be a civic servant, a police officer. Well, I don't know what the drug sc screening tests are, but the stigma is gone. You can even like go to church and smoke pot and people aren't like, oh, OMG. Like it's not a shocker anymore. Mm -hmm. So if you were the type of parent 30 years ago where your kid came home and smoked pot, you have two choices. One is to fortify your castle and say, get that out of my house. The second is to say, how is there anything we can learn here as parents to include you and this belief not that the parents need to start smoking pot, but that they can actually have a house and a belief system that's big enough that it's not threatened by or that it can include these other practices or belief systems. Mm -hmm. Now, if 30 years ago parents did that and saw it as a learning opportunity, they're like, my kid's smoking pot. What are we going to do about it? Well, we could ignore it. We could kick it out or we could say, oh, tell me about, like, why do you find that interesting? Like, what are the pros and cons? Like, have you thought about the legality of it? Um, what do you feel when you do it? Why do you like it? You know, let me hear this. Let me, like, let's just talk about it mm -hmm. and not stigmatize it. I think that could have been an incredible opportunity for parents to rethink what the purpose of morality is. And by the way, I mean, we started off 
talking about Jesus, I think Jesus did this kind of stuff all the time where he, where he turned morality on its head and said that ultimately loving God and loving people is the only real morality that exists. And he pissed everyone off because he was constantly challenging the laws, the religious laws of the day. So what do you think that is for, so pot was 30 years ago. What is it for today? What's a good example? Fuck, I do not know, and I'm kind of worried about it. Whatever it is, it's going to, this is what I know. Whatever it is, it's going to stretch us. It's going to be something that you and I. So I I feel like, because I'm trying to put myself in 30 years ago in that position. When When things aren't accepted culturally, there's actually, I think, a big reason why people can't, like, the parents in this case can't handle their kids doing it is because they're afraid of what other people will think because it's such a i think that's i think that's one reason that's one reason and the rule well and then there's like fear of what the thing will do to their kids like make them whatever if it's a religious thing, it's like, oh, they're going to go to hell now. If it's uh, not a religious thing, maybe it's just more like, oh, now they're going to be a deadbeat now or get hurt. Well, we've talked about this a lot over the years, and I don't think we've spent a lot of time on the podcast about it. <clears throat> but this really comes down to what your viewpoint of parenting is. Now, yeah. a lot of people, their belief of parenting is – that their job is to form their child into something that is successful both like academically financially and morally and there's a lot of different terms people use for that in the biblical communities it was called like you know shaping a child or training training yeah um but I don't think it's a spiritual belief or a religious belief. I think most people view that as their job as a parent is to primarily they view it as their role is to shape and form a child, Mm -hmm. which that's been the biggest shift that we have in parenting. I do not believe that is our primary role as a parent is to shape a child. I believe our primary role as a parent is actually to listen and to provide an environment where a child can thrive, but to be humble enough to be able to have ourselves be shaped. And to be able to accept whatever may come in your relationship with your child. I think that's a bonus, sure. Yeah. But using biblical language, because we were steeped in this for a long time, the language I used to use back then was people primarily view their role as if they are a blessing to their children. They need to give and pour and shape and change and mold and all these like kind of verbs that they do towards their children that are the beneficiaries. The Bible is really fascinating because for how important parenting is, it says very little prescriptively in the entire damn book. And mostly what it says is that children are the blessing from God, which implies that as a parent, your primary role with your child is actually as a beneficiary. It's actually as a receiver, not a giver. And I don't know any Christians that actually believe that, by the way, <laughs> but that's that's my understanding of what the Bible, the emphasis of the Bible's perspective on children is. Most people take it, most religious people take it, okay, children are a blessing to me so that I can now shape them. That's they're, my blessing. They're basically like a project. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so the next point I have written here is instead of seeing parenting as the challenge of preparing our kids to withstand the outside world, what if our job is to prepare our hearts and our homes to bring the parts of the outside world that our kids absorb and evolve into be a, to being big enough to accept those things and to accept them? Um. Now, this is really different, by the way, than endorsing. I mean, your kids can smoke pot or listen to rap music. And that doesn't mean they need to come home and you need to be like, damn, that music's lit. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to like it. But but we need to be big enough, 
our if our belief system is really robust enough and we have enough love to be able to include that and to and not feel insecure or threatened because they like it and to be able to yeah. say you know my belief system or my faith or my love is big enough to include you and your freaking hobbies mm -hmm. like you don't have to stop listening to rap music when you're around me like and i don't need to like rap music yeah but i think our kids know like what things we approve of or disapprove of mm -hmm. and they'll hide the things that we disapprove of because they want us to approve of them yeah so one the final example i'm going to give is that in our house growing up like we had to use manners like we had to say please and thank you and i think the older we get there's two types of of grandparents i see those that like double down on manners and they're like curmudgeonly old and they're like please and thank you like say please and thank you spoiled brat kid you know they and that's like they just repeat that again and again and you're like oh you're around grandpa grandpa like say please or thank you or practice the manners or don't say this word or that word or whatever mm -hmm. but the other option is that as grandparents or as parents as we evolve we learn that please and thank you is nice you know great if you want to teach it teach it whatever but if our kids come back and they start to develop language that we don't feel like is super respectful, instead of getting hung up on the words ourselves, we're constantly maturing and using with our desire to include them and who they are and their beliefs, we're not going to get hung up on the things that used to tweak us 20 years ago. You know, I'm like, you know what, you can use please or thank you, but really I'm concerned about your heart. And even if you're kind of a spoiled brat, like I'm not going to let it tee me off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in that way, our kids going outside of our gate, so to speak, or our home or the walls and getting exposed to the world doesn't need to be a danger or a threat or this big scary thing. I think we can actually embrace it and be like, man, what are they going to bring back? And, you know, mm -hmm. holy crap, am I going to be able to handle it? Yeah. But at least understand that, that maybe that's the challenge instead of being like, oh, crap, how do I protect my kids from the outside world? Yeah. It's instead, how do I enlarge as a person to be able to include things that I'm not very comfortable with or I don't know much about or I have these assumptions but that's all they are, our assumptions. The final caveat I want to add, I think there's going with this, the original interpretation that I've heard of the prodigal son was that the father was doing a great job because he invited the son back in. And as the story goes, he even like ran out to meet him. What I like about this thought experiment of this kind of like newer way is it's saying that maybe we can do one better than that you know because there's this kind of methodology of parenting that goes i'm a good dad if okay you go experiment and pull your crazy stunts but you're always welcome back here but here's never going to change here's this static place where if you're going to live under my roof you follow my rules if you're going to smoke pot or have sex go do that go do it out there and when you come back here, I'll always be here for you, but you're going to have to like play by the rules if you're going to be here. And so in a way it comes across as being a hero because it's like, oh, like my doors are open. Like you can come back into my space, but it also, also presents this kind of like weak perspective of space, which is like, it's very static and it's like, it's not very it's still robust. still exclusive because you have conditions on your kids that they have to be a certain way to be accepted in your space yeah so that's not what i'm saying here i'm not saying i mean i think that's a step in the right direction is like yeah your kid we have an open door policy and our kids are always welcome back but it's not just saying they're always welcome back to play by our rules it's saying you bring who you really are to our space and i want you to be as close as you can 
that I can bear, <laughs> you know, and maybe we should be honest about the language instead of saying, making it spiritualizing it. Yeah. Cause I mean, it, it, it may happen that you can't handle your kid or we won't be able to handle our kid. And if that's the case, I think that's okay. Um, but to be honest and to say, I can't handle you or your actions, but that doesn't, I don't need to judge them. I just can't handle them. <laughs> yeah, we, cre- um, we create boundaries all the time for all sorts of reasons. And, and I would hope the goal for myself, if that, when that happens, I, the goal would be to be able to handle it at one point. So, cause I can't ex- expect them to change for me. At least deeply. Yeah. In a way, they change right on the outside. Like they act. Yeah. They play a part. Right. Because kids are fucking wizards. And all humans are, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah. We it's all have kids. intuition. I'm not even saying it's a bad thing. Yeah. That we can feel. I mean, that's how I was at family reunions for a long time. You know, for the first 15 years of our marriage, I go to your parents' house for Christmas and it's like I play a part. And it's like, I smile, I try and ask a few questions. Of course, it wears me out. And I go home and I want to beat my head on a wall. You basically have to check a part of your brain at the door because it's not welcome there. Yeah, and I just have to remember, okay, I'm not going to talk about these things, but I'll try and keep it cordial and talk about these things. And, and you know, that that works. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I just want to challenge. I just want to share how I'm being challenged to try and go for something deeper and better. And I think there's people out there that would probably accept that challenge mm-hmm. that are our listeners. Yeah. yeah. So very simply, once again, I'm going to read the first sentence. Create a world at home that is big enough for our kids to bring back the lessons they learn in the outside world. So whatever they learn out there, which becomes a part of who they are, mm-hmm. is welcome at our home. Mm-hmm. and embraced and yeah. even sought after yeah um hmm. you know i mean this is okay final tangent <laughs> but th- <laughs> i just geek out on storytelling and you know how he said like it's a tragedy in a story like when you study story composition you learn that a story is all about change it's all about a character changing <clears throat> they face situations and scenarios that force them to change and usually the climax is the end when the character, it can go one of two ways. Either the character can stand up and be brave and do the right thing and go down this change that's basically going to change them forever, or they can puss out and take the easy way out and not change, you know, go back mm-hmm. to where they were. And you mm-hmm. always want the character to, to make the harder decision, but that changes them forever. And in Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey, the hero leaves home, you know, this is like Star Wars, right? He leaves home, Luke Skywalker, in the first episode, but he comes back to home at the end. He meets his dad at the end, but he's a different person at that point. That's the ultimate story. Um, in a way, I've realized, you know, our kids are quite literally our DNA. You know, they're they are they're the same us in a way. Mm-hmm. And the best story is almost like what can they do with the same DNA that's different or better? How can they evolve? Mm -hmm. But as a parent, sometimes I don't want to see it. It's, it's actually like threatening to watch them go beyond where I was comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And I want to hold them back or ignore these certain parts. But the better story is if they take the same stuff that I'm made out of Mm -hmm. and they actually expand and do it a little differently and do it, I don't want to say better, but they go a little further Mm -hmm. um, and they can withstand a little bit more. Mm -hmm. You know, they're going to be smoking pot. This next generation is. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to see because I'm like, well, we didn't smoke pot and it's so easy to get attached to this code. Until we were 38. (laughs) And to see success as fortifying the building and not letting our kids really, Mm -hmm. you know, we almost want them to repeat us. Yeah. Yeah, I think it can hurt your ego sometimes if you see your kids doing things that, yeah, I don't know, that are different or. Okay, I'm over it. How about you? (laughs) 
It is. What? Just happened. Where am I? You gotta put it back. Yep. Yeah. Okay, we're back. It is time for the news. Okay, on topic. I did not even plan it this way with my little example. First article, and this is gonna be a little quicker format. We're not spending a lot of time on the news today, but Cincinnati City Council passes marijuana ordinance. Oh, wow. Does that mean Ohio or It's Cincinnati? actually just Cincinnati. Cincinnati police will no longer be citing people for having or using what some consider small amounts of pot. So on Wednesday, which actually it's a couple weeks ago now, uh, the city council voted to decriminalize possessing 100 grams or less as long as you aren't using it in public. And you can't. Are you still supposed to not sell it? Is that right? I think it's still illegal to sell. Which is funny because, like, where are all these people getting it? <laughs> and it's so weird to me that it can't be done in public. If you can smoke it in private, why not be able to light a fucking joint at the park? Or walking down the street like a free human being. Yeah. It's well, like I feel like it's sort of like alcohol, like, in our culture. Even though alcohol is obviously legalized, it's very, I don't know. It's considered taboo to, like... To, to carry a, like a beer with you through the park with, where there's kids around which is really funny to me which but I don't get it uh, yeah i think it's just our cultures so up, cincinnati uptight, took obviously. away there was a 150 dollar fine so this is a fascinating way of phrasing it. cincinnati took away the 150 dollar fine and the stigma that came along with using marijuana hmm. i don't know if it works that way if you can just remove the stigma i know overnight at least i think that takes a little while but i think it is a step in the right direction yeah in terms of removing the stigma right so this says it's okay if you're 12 years so this is the person that opposed it council member david mann said this says it's okay if you're 12 years old in cincinnati to possess 100 grams of marijuana why on earth are we doing it that doesn't make any sense to me <laughs> that's deep <laughs> maybe maybe this article is like biased i'm hoping he said something a little bit deeper I know. than that like why it's like, this doesn't, doesn't make any sense, sense to me it's like okay okay that's obvious um currently 33 states allow medical marijuana 11 states and washington dc allow recreational use and an initiative is on the precipice of making it on ohio's ballot in november that would legalize the use possession and sale of marijuana for persons ages 21 or older in ohio hmm. okay you want to hear the kicker mm -hmm. so Again, if you're going to use pot in Cincinnati, it has to be behind closed doors. Remember that, which is a pain for us because we leave our doors open. So we have to close them, I guess. <laughs> this ordinance stipulates no public consumption and it doesn't go until 30 days. Which, do you know when that 30 days is? Uh, no. I think it's July 11th. Oh. Which is my birthday. Happy birthday, Ben. <laughs> Except for I don't live in Ohio, I live in Kentucky. One mile away from Ohio, Cincinnati. <laughs> we'll make a little trip across the river. I'm happy about this. Yeah. I, I just think the rule is dumb. And I don't, like, really care. I don't spend a lot. I'm not, like, super happy. I'm not overjoyed. Um, legality was keeping me from smoking most of the time. I don't know why, because I don't mind breaking the speed limit. But for some reason, I think the legality was pounded into my head as a kid. And... The, I've smoked pot, what, five times? I, I've never been able to get high. I, it's kind of on my bucket list, something I'd like to do in this <laughs> life. Um, but it's just, it does seem like kind of a dumb rule to me. So I'm happy for people that, it, I don't think it's going to affect me a whole lot. Although, heck, I'm going to, I'll take advantage of it. So do people, are people like serving jail time for marijuana usage? And if so, like, do they get released? No. Oh. Y yes and no. They they are. And that's why one of the people actually voted against it was because it wasn't enough for them. They wanted it to be legalized and they wanted everyone that's been imprisoned yeah. to that's, be released. Because that's where I'm just like, uh, that just, how, I mean, it'd be sucky to be in prison no matter what, but how sucky would it be to be in prison for that and it gets, like, and you're just like, damn it, I was born in the wrong era. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
Okay, sad news. Um, Mount Washington hiker died from hypothermia on the app. Well, not oh, on the wow. Appalachian Trail, but on Mount Washington, which the Appalachian Trail goes over Mount Washington. Jeez. But they were hiking up to Mount Washington, which is the um, windiest recorded place, I believe, on the planet. Which is really weird to me because I feel like Everest would be windier than that. But maybe it's kind maybe of I'm getting my facts wrong. An anomaly. Uh, yeah, I don't know. So Mount Washington, which is the second Windy. highest point on the Appalachian Trail that we walked on, a woman died. Uh, she was a hiker from New Jersey, um, and she was 63. And she was just hiking from the base of the mountain to the top. Um, but the conditions were freezing with a wind chill of 12 degrees and 60 mile per hour winds and rain and ice. Ugh, and they miserable. rescued her. They hiked her the last 0.2 miles, which isn't very far. So it wasn't an incredible rescue. But they took her to the hospital and she died at the hospital. Jeez. So she like almost made it down or she was almost no, she was at, going up she's almost at the top as well yeah and then they rescued i just don't know how this happens i guess your body just it's too much right like it starts shutting down hyperthermia is like when things start shutting I down yes right? it just seems like there should be a lot of signs and things you can do and mount washington is a crowded area but what if she was alone at the top. no she wasn't she was with the family Okay, yeah, that's kind of interesting. So, and we hiked um, up Mount Washington into mm. predicted storms. Like the yeah. weather was getting really bad, and it but, wasn't. But it, it was actually sunny, which there's only like a, a handful of times it's actually sunny up at that mountain, I think. But Okay, final news article. Crap, it got cut off. Ten-year-old girl becomes youngest person ever to climb Yosemite's El Capitan. This is from, I can't find, my, when I print these articles off, it doesn't, oh, some website called Maker. Oh, Makers, yeah. Okay, so in the last five days, Sela Schneider scaled 3,000 feet of steep rock formations to reach the top of Yosemite's El Cap, and she's only 10 years old. She climbed 31 pitches on rock climbing sections with the help of her dad and a close family friend. Hmm. That's so cool. So she's the youngest person at 10. Wow. Um, and this part is kind of cool to me. So, okay, if you guys aren't familiar, this is like, is it, I think El Cap is like the tallest granite face or rock face in the world. Like sheer rock face. Hmm. So... 31 pitches which means 31 lengths of rope which wow. means that you have to you know when we were climbing i did a few multi-pitch routes but really one pitch is a chore i mean you're talking like 150 feet i think give or take it was all meters so i forget what it was but you know so, so you're doing 31 full climbs with i mean you can rest but hmm. yeah. wow so they did over five days which isn't breaking any speed records but this is the part that got to me after the record breaking five day climb the three camped out at the top of the slab while michael and his friend were exhausted sila was like oh no that's not it oh here it is sorry <laughs> once she topped out which means she made it to the top she was the first one to go to this tree that is a symbolic thing for climbers and she just broke down in tears michael recalled hmm. as the dad she said it was her first happy tears she's ever had so what I like about that is I don't think most people think kids are capable of wrapping their mind around that type of victory. Mm. I think we treat 10 year olds like they're little annoying brats and like they're not capable of that type of emotion or grasping doing something like incredibly hard and then being so happy you accomplished and finding it. value in it and finding yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I've wow. seen this with our kids. Mm -hmm. Um, of various ages where you know we finish a marathon well even i mean i don't know i i just i remember i have this other story where we had just got back from the bahamas like staying at the atlantis mm -hmm. 
and it was like you know that's like the nicest resort in the world if travel channel has anything to say about it because they're always running things on atlantis and and we had just hiked the wonderland trail which is this 95 mile loop around mount rainier and then we go to atlantis and i asked the kids because we were going to go speak at rei so kind of as a joke i said hey which which did you like better atlantis or the wonderland trail thinking that they were all going to say atlantis like no duh it was like a tropical resort with like you know it's basically like tropical disneyland like Mm -hmm. water slides and just entertainment junk and every single one of them including our what five-year-old or something at the time memory said that they preferred the wonderland yeah and that's when i that's when i realized oh kids are smart and they want more than we're giving them and they can actually process long-term gratification and the benefits of <clears throat> complex and difficult activities way more than I thought. Mm-hmm. So to hear that this girl gets to the top, she's 10, mm-hmm. you know, and then she cries because she's so happy. Yeah. I'm like, that's cool. It is. Um, it, I, it's a shame if kids I, don't have these types of opportunities. I think it's really cool that the dad and the mom, presumably, that they let her do that. You know, so many parents would be like, like they couldn't handle the what ifs. Well, yeah, the pressure of if something went wrong, you can imagine oh, they, they would be... be getting crucified right now. Oh, absolutely. I'm surprised it didn't say more about that. But basically the dude is some like, he's an Ameri- American Mountain Guides Association certified rock guide and instructor. So he like knows his stuff and is like equipped not only because a lot of people climb they're not certified anything Mm -hmm. but he's he looks good to the public also yeah and then it says this after the record-breaking five-day climb the three camped out on top of the slab while michael and his friend were exhausted sila was like a little kid again and wanted to check everything out exploring almost like it was nothing (laughs) and that reminds me of like you know we run a marathon then fleet comes home and she like riding around on her bike like oh yeah they go like they're in business mode they know how to like you know when you're climbing multi-pitch stuff like literally other people's lives are in your hand well Mm. not literally they're not in your hand but you know i mean yeah um and then you go back to being a kid again like just like that (laughs) that's yeah that's cool though man okay um are you ready for some we got a phone call. We do. Cool. It is time for the phone calls, and you can be the official phone call button mm-hmm. pusher. Hi, Ben and Cami. My name is Christine, and I'm from New York. Um, I haven't listened to a ton of podcasts, but I have watched your YouTube videos for a couple months. Um this is kind of repetitive. I know you've already made a video about vaccines and stuff, but coming from New York, um, just in the last week or so, there's been a new bill eliminating religious exemptions. Uh, so like over 20,000 people are affected by this, um, you know, new bill because kids have to be vaccinated by this. Friday, if they want to keep attending school, camp, or daycare, public or private. So I guess my question is, what would you do? Uh, I know you choose to homeschool, but I'm just wondering, like, say one of your kids wanted to go to college and, and they had to be vaccinated, or I don't know, if if you have any advice or insight into, uh, into this. I know a few other states have... Um, this same rule and it's really hard um to go to school without vaccines like i said public private or even you know daycare camp whatever so um yeah i guess i'm not asking you to incriminate yourself or anything but i'm just curious how how might you go around this (laughs) this is a crazy question I'm also a registered nurse licensed in New York, um, but I haven't worked as a nurse for a couple years um, since I had my daughter. I have almost three-year-old. I'm a single parent. 
I'm a caregiver uh, for my brother who has Down syndrome. I caught your um, documentary um, just a couple months ago. I watched it with my daughter. We love you guys. I'm fascinated by your family. I think you guys are amazing, and I feel like I'm learning so much from you. And I'm totally overweight and out of shape, and I don't run. But I just would like to see myself doing some of what you're doing. And I'm inspired by homeschooling and, and everything and just finding it, like, so challenging to imagine doing that and feeling like I don't have a choice. Um, you know, so right now my daughter goes to Montessori. So anyway, yeah, feeling like I don't have a choice is really weird. Feeling like the government's telling um, us what to do with our kids is just tough. Um, but thank you for making your videos and podcasts, and I just love you guys, and I think you're amazing, and hope you get some more comfortable chairs. <laughs> I just, it's, I, I was inspired just hearing her story, <laughs> that she's a single parent, She's got a couple kids. She's a caretaker for her Down syndrome what was her nephew. Name? I, I didn't catch it. Again. Yeah. Let's catch it. Hi, Ben and Cammie. My name is Christine. 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 Man. Thanks, Christine. Yeah, that's um, it's interesting. Our 16-year-old is actually thinking about going to high school, and I just had this conversation with her about the immunizations and I, I kind of took it for granted thinking that they would just let us sign a waiver that says like if there's an outbreak they have to leave the kids that are immunized which is what we did in Washington years ago when Dove was in kindergarten um yeah like what I mean that's a really hard thing to just I didn't know that about New York. Did you? Well, it just happened. Okay, yeah. But, like, I'm not surprised at it, all. No. I mean, I just think our government, there's tides, right? And there's they people pick and pissed. choose. People are pissed. It's like people are voting. Like, they want it to be a thing. There's t- Yeah, there's, there's, there's in each decade, era, whatever you want to call it, there's things that are chosen that m- are made law. To me, it... To me, this is, like, pretty simple. But I think there's a deep issue here. Um, you know, I'm not against immunizations. Like, we're, you know, we've had to clarify numerous times. We're not anti-vax. Um, most of our kids have not been vaccinated. Because at the time, we evaluated the pros and cons. And for us, at that time, the cons outweighed the pros. Mm-hmm. But the important thing to me is that we're not talking not, – nothing's black or white. Um, and the pros and cons discussion is a constantly evolving discussion Yeah, that each parent needs to take into account what the pros and cons are for them and their situation and their children and do the best with what they got to – you know, for whatever's worth it to them, for what their values are. Yeah. So – you know, I I could just see it going so many ways for so many different people where now it's worth it for them to do it. Great. Do it. And yeah, there's some there's going to be some cons, you know, but now there's new cons for not doing it that you have to take into account. And we could focus all day on how much that sucks or whatever, but I don't think that's going to change the fact of the matter. The thing that she said that stood out to me the most was she said this line, um, it sucks as a parent not feeling like I have the choice anymore. And what I would say is, I mean, this is the belief that's, I think, helped us get to where we've got. You always have a choice. Always. Now, that could mean that you go to jail. That's That would be a con. Or you have to move out of the United States or out of that state. Or, or... you have to homeschool or this or that. Yeah. Um, but it's still a choice. Mm -hmm. I think maybe there's maybe another way of maybe what she's feeling is now there's new consequences for a certain choice Yeah, that weren't there before. And this is where, and I I don't want to talk down to this Christine because I do not know her situation, but just in general, I don't feel entitled to anything 
I, and th I think this is one of the things that separates us with what I hear, why people just care about politics so much. Like, I think freedom is great. I don't feel entitled to it. I think public schools, it's nice that they're there. I don't feel like we deserve them or are entitled to them. Even healthcare, the biggest thing people, everyone's saying, like, we need to, we need to have healthcare. Like, I don't know who these people are that are saying we need this, like, new thing that no one has had access to globally or historically outside of the last 30 years. It hasn't, like, existed the way it exists I think now. it's hard not to feel entitled if you've already been given it. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. But that entitlement is actually a form of slavery because then it becomes leverage yeah. to be used against you, and you feel like you need it. Yeah, that's true. You know, to be either a good parent or a good person or mm -hmm. just because you feel like you're going to feel shitty if you don't have it or feel unsafe. Mm -hmm. So it's always a choice, though. You know, so if if you do vaccinate your kids, I hope you do it because you are saying the pros outweigh the cons and you're making a choice. And the choice is to do something that will allow your kids to stay in school or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do it, you know, we have to accept the consequences that come with that. There's always consequences. Maybe we'll get kicked out of school or the state or whatever. So, you know, if that's scary to you, if you don't like that, if that is um, outweighs the pros, then I would say, you know, you're going to have to make your decision mm -hmm. based upon that. Um, but I, I, I think the scariest thing is when these things are pitched, whether it's science I mean, this has scientific backing, but I believe people are actually turning it into a black and white moral issue, mm -hmm. and they're pitching it as if you don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes, you know, that has never, I've never seen that work out. Um, well, it does in a way, but it it's really hard to grow as a parent and as individuals when you feel like you don't have a choice. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah. All right. That's it. That's it. That's it. Yeah, those are, Never those mind. are previous calls. <laughs> um, we have one phone call on ice that I'm going to save for next time because there are no backup ones. Yeah. All right. But um, I wanted to thank you guys for the chair fund. If you wanted to support this podcast, we are sitting on some flat, lame ass stools right now and we started a chair fund that derek donated twenty dollars to and you can join derek in donating money if you would like um via paypal or venmo and those links are in the show notes as long as as well as the links to the book we mentioned and the links to these articles if you want to read more about that kind of stuff um and this podcast is available on Spotify and YouTube if you want to watch the video and iTunes and pretty much anywhere you can find podcasts. You should be able to find it. And if you want to leave a message, we would really appreciate that. Um, I know it's weird. I know it's hard. I know you're putting yourself out there. But listen, if anyone understands, it's us. <laughs> the phone number is 206-651-5744. That's all I got for you guys. Yep. Peace. Today. Peace out. Thank you for listening to Fight for Together. We'll see you next time.